everyone, and welcome to On the Horizon in Healthcare. I'm Beth Brooks, the Clinical Advisor for Vivian Health. And today we're talking to one of my colleagues who is a just an amazing, amazing nurse leader, Dr. Marianne Alexander. And she is someone I've known for many years. And so today we want to talk about the recent study that the National Council for State Boards of Nursing released and talk a little bit about the findings from that study. So before I do that, though, let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. Alexander. So Marianne Alexander is the Chief Officer for Nursing Regulation at the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. And Marianne also is the Editor-in-Chief for the Journal of Nursing Regulation. So in her role as the Chief Officer for Nursing Regulation, she's responsible for the oversight of the Division of Nursing Regulation, which includes all activities related to licensure, practice, education, discipline, research, and legislation. That's a lot, Marianne. <laughs> and then prior to her time at the National Council, Marianne, which is how I know her, was the executive director for the Board of Nursing here in Illinois. So I just want to say welcome to my colleague, Marianne, and thank her for joining us today. So hi, Marianne. <laughs> hi, Beth, and thank you for having me. So I'm so excited. It's, you know, I've, I can remember almost the last time we chatted, so I'm excited to see you and hear what's going on. But before we do that, tell me a little bit about your journey, because young nurses and nurses in, you know, the middle of their career always wonder, how did you get that job? Like, I didn't even know there was such a job as the chief of nursing regulation. So tell us a little bit about your journey, because you and I think we have a common rush in our Rush University Medical Center in our background. Indeed, we do. And I was an advanced practice nurse at Rush. I was working with a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and I loved it. I loved patient care. I loved what we did. But, you know, I realized that there was a part of me that was very interested in public policy mm -hmm. and how nurses could influence that. I felt more nurses needed to be seated at the table and making decisions about nursing policy and healthcare policy. And I felt as much as I was impacting many people's lives and the role that I had. Certainly, when you are involved in policy, you have the potential to impact thousands of people's lives all at once. And so I decided I was going to pursue that journey. And I went back to school. I went to UIC. I enrolled in their PhD nursing program. And I had a special emphasis in public policy and healthcare policy. And I was fortunate enough at the time, I was able to do an internship at the National Institutes of Health, which was a great experience. And I learned so much about research and turning data to policy. And that is really something that I felt was really important. In fact, my dissertation is on evidence-based policy and its effectiveness. And so with that, I got the PhD and coinciding with that, the physician that I was working with decided to pursue another avenue in his career. He moved back to Taiwan and I was just very fortunate enough to get the job with the state of Illinois as the nursing coordinator and the executive director of the board of nursing. And I did that for two years, loved it but was recruited by the CEO at NCSBN. This was a new role she was starting and she wanted me for it. And after a lot of contemplation, I landed here. Yeah, I remember that because you always came to the IONL meetings. Yes. When it was, when it was Illinois Organization for Nurse Leaders, which is the affiliate for the American Organization of Nurse Executives, now Nurse Leaders. We always, we know if our, I would, you're on the program committee, it's like, oh, we need to get Mary Ann Alexander to come and tell us what's going on from a policy perspective. So I can remember those, the old days, right? Um, right. So we both have been around a little while. So I'd like to talk about 
an interesting development, right? I remember for many years as a new grad, there was the government, our federal government, always conducted the National Sample Survey of Registered Nurses. And that was sort of the way that the whole country knew what was the nursing workforce like in America. We knew where nurses lived, which state, we knew demographics, we knew which specialty, we knew which setting. And so that was always the go-to place for data about nursing. And then in 2018, the government decided to stop doing that report. So just talk a little bit about, I don't know the details, I, I'm, I have no idea why they stopped, but talk a little bit about how that stopped and then how the National Council sort of picked up that ball, if you will, and how you've been doing all this work now, keeping, keeping us informed about the, what the nursing workforce looks like in, in the United States. Right, well, it, it's exactly as you said, we were alarmed that it ceased to be conducted because certainly it was very informative and very important information. And we had <clears throat> had the capability of doing it. And so we partnered with the National Forum of State Workforce Centers. We used their minimum data set and we got the ball rolling. And now we do a national sample survey every two years. HRSA has since started theirs back up but they do theirs every four years. We're able to do it every two years and we're able to analyze the data and get it out a little bit quicker than they are. Yeah, and so that's still though, where people who are doing research or whatnot, that's where you go to find what's going on in our workforce. And that's been something that you've done, National Council has just continued to do. And then most recently, which is why I wanted to talk with you today, was the research that you've been conducting. Because among all the things you do, Marianne, <laughs> research is one of those pieces in your in your job responsibilities. So in April of this year, the National Council unveiled their new research called Examining the Impact of the COVID-19 Pandemic on Burnout and Stress Among U.S. Nurses. And I think what was what caught my eye, A, there was a lot of press around that, and then those results were even released at a press conference in Washington, D.C. So talk a little bit about how that went and, and what was that like to share that data and those results and what was some of the reaction that happened around this study? Because there's been so much talk about what's gone on with the nursing workforce since COVID, who's stressed and who's struggling and what are we going to do? So talk about that press conference and what that was like and the reactions. Right, well, it was an amazing event. We had a lot of coverage. We brought some nursing leaders together to be there. So we presented the data and then we had a discussion on how to address the issues that nursing seem to be facing in the near future, because we don't want our report to be seen as a negative report that's all doom and gloom. We want it to be seen as a call for action, and we wanted the action to begin at that press conference. And so we were able to have a discussion as to how we were going to address the issues that came out of the report. And I have to say, all of the discussion at this generated, this was picked up by over 1,500 news sources. So it got huge press and we're still, we're still getting requests for mm -hmm. interviews and we have questions by the media all the time. Well, it's funny you should say that because today I was reading in the Wall Street Journal about registered nurses and visas and the inability to get visas right now to bring nurses over. And there was the National Council State Board of Nursing data. So talk a little bit about the results because everybody's been talking about some of the work that Peter Burhouse has done. And there was the study that came out about how many young nurses have left the workforce during COVID. And then there was 100,000 nurses that left and everyone assumed that those were nurses that were retiring. And so talk a little bit about what you all found with the, the workforce and who, who were the respondents? Was it nurses from all different ages? Because the results haven't been published yet, right? There's just well, been- They've been released. We released okay. them the day of the press conference. Okay. 
and they can be found on the Journal of Nursing Regulation website. Okay. It's free, of, it's free of charge. Okay. So if somebody doesn't have access to a library the journal is in, they can just go to the website. So talk a little bit about the findings. I'm just curious about what are some of the things that were surprising or those, ah, oh, wow, didn't expect that or, ah, oh, that's what we thought, you know? Well, we knew uh, nurses had left the workforce because of COVID. We didn't realize the magnitude of it. So uh, over 100,000 nurses left the, the workforce due to COVID. 800,000 RNs and 200,000 LPNs, that's a million nurses, expressed an intent to leave nursing in the next five years. And 15% of them had 10 years of experience or less. That was really surprising to us mm -hmm. because generally when we ask that question in former surveys, it's always nurses that are around retirement age that have that intent to leave. This is the first time that we were seeing young nurses who had recently entered the workforce that are, are our future mm -hmm. intent to leave. And that really calls for action. And, mm -hmm. and as much as we need to recruit more nurses, we need to retain the nurses that we have in the workforce. And so action is needed right then and there. Yeah. Well, and I think that's, a. am glad you brought that up because this intent to leave the profession versus intent to leave your position often gets mixed up depending on who's writing the story. So it sounds like, did you, did the National Council ask both of those questions, leave your position and leave the profession? Or did you just focus on nurses who were intending to leave the profession? It was nurse. The question was about leaving the profession. Okay. So that is, that is scary, right? Because that's oh, absolutely. Kind of, yeah. Nurses, it would probably be a higher number even than that for a nurse that might have an intent to leave the, their position, but it's actually the loss from the workforce that concerns us. Right. So I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. So what were there other legislators at the meeting or other Congress people who kind of said, hey, this is something the government needs to move and and or how did that fit with folks? No, we like I said, Lisa Blunt Rochester, she was there representing policymakers and legislators. We didn't have any others there. My guess is others have heard about it. I know Bernie Sanders is very interested in this topic. Well, I was just going to ask you that. So Bernie Sanders, he's the chair of the Senate's Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. So that's called the HELP Committee. He had that hearing in February. And then I believe shortly thereafter, he proposed an increase of $200 billion into the health care budget and $60 billion of that to grow the workforce. And then that was in the early part of the year. And then here comes your study and the results in April. So what has there been any, or is it too soon? Is there been any interest or has his office called you and said, Mary, you know, help, <laughs> what, do, what do we? No, I have not heard from him. Okay. <laughs> uh, before the study came out, I did. we did hear from the White House who uh, we were able to release some early data to them. So I know they have an interest in this as well. So I think that people in the legislature and in the executive branch of government certainly seem to be concerned that this is an issue. Well, that's because they're all like pretty old. I mean, you look at our senators, right? It's a very old population. They are going to need nurses. You would think that they'd be like really interested in, in what we're going to do about that problem. You know, how we're going to change or or draw and entice more nurses in into nursing. So what are some of the did in in the study did you talk about recommendations or was this more of a call to action sort of we did not make recommendations in this in the study however we did find out some of the reasons nurses are leaving and that is certainly a stepping stone for employers to use but what I would advise every employer in this country 
is to first read the report mm -hmm. and really take note of what is happening. And then I would say they need to talk to and even survey their own nurses and their institution to find out what's going on right there and the how can they save the nurses and their institution? How can they retain them? How can they save them from leaving? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, some of the things that nurses said, why they have an intent to leave, burnout is a big issue. You know, we need some mental health services to help nurses so they have somebody to talk to when things are getting really stressful. There is an overall feeling that they're not appreciated by employers or patients. Mm -hmm. There are things that can be done for that. There is alarmingly violence in the workplace and employers need to address that. Mm -hmm. They need to make the workplace safe. Mm -hmm. And nurses need to know how to de-escalate situations that they're in. Nurses feel there are is a lot of unsafe staffing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the new nurses said there was a lack of prepara a preparation to enter the workforce. And we know new graduates always feel that way, but especially these last few cohorts, they entered the workforce after their education was spent during COVID. And we know a lot of that got shortchanged and was done differently. Mm -hmm. And so they're feeling the effects of that. You know, and I think that's what's so interesting, Marianne, is you're talking about, remind me because I don't know, what was the sample size for the for your survey from the National Council? How many nurses responded? Do you remember? Oh, well, there was almost 300. We collected data from almost 300,000 nurses, but not all of them participated in this aspect of some of these questions, because okay. some of the data, like I say, we have from states that automatically feed their data and, and have nurses uh, put their data into our workforce database that's called eNotify. So we don't even have to do a survey in those states anymore. Mm -hmm. And if every state participated, we would have current up-to-date information, workforce information on every nurse in this country. Wow. So I'm going to come back to that because we started to talk a little bit about the unique identifier before, but I, so if 300,000 nurses responded, that is by far the largest response rate of any of the surveys, because I think when the ANA has been doing workforce worksite pulse surveys. I think they had around 11,000 respondents. The National Student Nurses Association, I, I would have to honestly pull the paper out. I don't remember. And then the American Association of Critical Care Nurses. So those were the three studies that came out. And then the National Council date survey data comes out. So everybody is, there's a confluence of, of information here. And it's pretty consistent. There is no question because the new graduates answered that most of them did not have a good orientation. Most of them did not have a preceptor, did not have an, a mentor during COVID. And I, one of the findings from that survey that I found really concerning was they don't feel prepared to, to practice alone. There's, they don't, they don't have those skills and they don't, and they're worried about that. And so we're hearing, you know, it sounds like some of your data is the same. And then the burnout and the stress with those new grads was really high. And that, yes, it's always a stressful time when you're a new graduate, but this was beyond what we've normally seen. And then the A ANA data, I mean, it's just, to me, it's like, wow, we've really got some serious issues to address because this has been consistent now for a couple of years that what has gone on. Yeah, Beth, if I could just point out sure. some additional data that's very alarming. And even if these nurses weren't planning on leaving, we need to address it. 45% of nurses said they felt burnt out. 50% felt fatigued. 51% emotionally drained. And 
uh, a little over 29% said they were at the end of their rope. I mean, that is very disconcerting. We need to take care of the nurses so they can take care of patients safely. Right. And we do know that there's an increase in errors when a nurse feels burnt out. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting because earlier this week, I talked with Dr. Leslie Kelly. I don't know if you know Leslie. She's one of the nurse scientists at Common Spirit, and she's been doing a lot of work on burnout. And, you know, I remember, Marianne, when I was a new nurse way many years ago, you know, burnout was like my problem. Like I created my own burnout, but, but now the whole emphasis on burnout has changed and it's an organizational workplace syndrome. It is caused by what's going on in the work environment. It's not caused by me, Beth Brooks, having a bad day and then I get grumpy and then I'm stressed and fatigued and then I'm burned out. No, it's a workplace phenomenon. And I think as Leslie was describing it to me when the National Academies came out with their 2019 report, that was pretty groundbreaking that this is an organizational phenomenon. And you, if you don't fix the organizational issues, then any nurse who leaves and comes back to a toxic and not, I'm not saying organizations are all toxic, but if it's not a healthy work environment and someone leaves and you don't fix the work environment, no matter who comes, isn't going to stay. And so for the first time, really looking at burnout as a workplace syndrome, and then how do we attack that? And there's only one study that I've seen that made the financial argument that the money you spend as an organization on burnout prevention, you save, I don't remember the percentage, Marianne, but you save a lot of money on turnover costs because you just Absolutely. have to, right? Absolutely common sense, right. And you don't have to spend as much money on, you know, another thing is trans transition to practice programs. They're well worth their investment to get nurses off to a very good start right. in, in the work setting. Yeah. So you, so the top reasons, if you will, that you, in the study, the national council, you said burnout, we need some quick and intense solutions, mental health, being appreciated for the work that you do, and then de-escalation training or advice on how to de-escalate, and then the violence in the workplace. Did did your study differentiate between violence between nurses, per, patients, families? Because I know that was a, a pretty strong emphasis that came out in the ANA Work Pulse survey is that the violence had gone up quite a bit. Yeah. And I don't think that we actually, although we're going to be delving deeper into the data, we might come out with more information like that. But right now we know that it's overall violence that nurses are very concerned about. Yeah. Yeah. And I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and that the panel discussion was about violence. And I sat there and listened and there were at least three ideas that came out from these panelists about different solutions that would be really helpful and would probably work really well. And I'm and I was like, there weren't that many people attended the session. And I thought, ah, this is exactly what we need. Here are some, you know, right. experts giving solutions. And I, I yeah, it's it's an it's an interesting dilemma that certainly needs some attention. So, so I want to go back though and talk about the unique identifier and talk about how the National Council uses that and the, the opportunity there that's being missed because we don't have enough states having the right legislation to participate, if I'm getting all that. Well, and there are two separate things. Every nurse right now has a unique identifier. And so employers should be aware of that and know that because one valuable opportunity that they can use the unique identifier for is if they want to really track the hours, the time uh, of nursing care and, and translate that into cost and dollars. That can be a, a real good use of the unique identifier. But I talk with so many people and they really feel this is something 
really valuable to have out there and people talk about every nurse having an NPI. Well, it's gonna take a long time. Nurses, if you don't bill, aren't gonna readily sign up for that. Every nurse already has the unique identifier. And so employers need to know about it and, and use it to in any way that they think is gonna be helpful for them. Right, right. I think probably what happens is if you're a nurse and you're at an organization that has an electronic record, they assigned you a unique employee number, but really they could be using your- They should use the unique identifier, exactly. Okay, that makes sense. And and it helps us track a nurse from the time they take the NCLEX all the way through their career. Right. And that's what we don't have, right? I mean, we right. there, nobody does that as far as I know. Right. And so those are just a few things that are on the horizon too. I mean, the unique identifier is available now, but you know, this collection of workforce data is something that we should all be working towards. And we have the database, we have the system in place. It is a matter of getting legislation passed in states to, to collect it and store it. So how many states participate? Because I think, Marianne, from where I'm my chair, what we're always counting is how many states are in the compact or how many states have nurse practitioners that don't need a collaborative written agreement. I don't know that if people focus on or talk too much about which states do or don't participate in entering their workforce data. So what's the what's the percentage of states that are reporting? We were able to use data from about five states right now. Oh my, wow. You know, you, you can take a look at the state of Missouri, almost 99% of their nurses feed their data into eNotify. So Missouri has a state portrait of their nursing workforce. And so that's how valuable that is. And so we need more states to do that. So Marion, why does that mean a, a reg, like me as a nurse, Beth Brooks, I can't go on the Illinois, I don't know, I guess it would be the Department of Professional and Financial Regulation. I can't dump my information into eNotify. That has to come from. No, you can. Okay. Every nurse in this country has access to e-notify and can put register themselves and put their data into it. Uh, but what would be the easiest for every nurse to do is upon renewing their license, they get a little message to go to e the e-notify or something that would take them automatically to e-notify. And while they're renewing their license, they just update their information. I didn't know that, Marian. I think part of the challenge is that everybody or every nurse who's out here in the world, we just think of NCLEX and we think of nursing licenses. We don't necessarily think of the National Council as this resource for all of this workforce data, too. I, I had no, you know, I mean, I had a little bit of an idea, but I had no idea it was ext as extensive as it is. So that's... Yeah. Yeah, we need to we need to tell more people about that. Well, I think Marianne, I've I've kind of gone through my questions. So we we know that the National Council for State Boards of Nursing is collecting workforce data where we you are encouraging every nurse to enter their data and to e-notify, but probably more so we'd like more states to be involved in entering their nursing because until we get a better picture it's it's really difficult and i i for one would be would love to know like migration patterns which states and where are nurses moving and i know there's some work around that but it's it's not as precise as it could be if the unique identifier isn't being used so right. yeah right so what so are you waiting now for bernie sanders to call <laughs> And do you think they'll, the health committee will come back and look at this data for, for some of that work they're doing? Well, maybe. And certainly federal funding would be very helpful. We could give them a lot of ideas as to where it could be focused. But Beth, this is really an employer challenge. Yeah. Every employer has to address this issue yeah. because 
put all the federal funding and great programs around it and collect all the data you want. Mm -hmm. But if employers don't address some of the basic issues that are going on in their institution, we are not going to retain the nurses that we have. And yeah. it's going to be hard to recruit new nurses as well. Good point. Thank you for like putting my feet back on the ground because you're exactly right. And I believe that it's interesting what's happened through this the, the pandemic and and the wage the wages with the travel nurses and nurses moving and all this there's just been some interesting commentary about why aren't nurses paid more and why aren't we listening to the nurses and i suppose there's no time like the present because you're exactly right to bring more people into a system where we don't have healthy work environments it's it's probably not going to help us in in work keeping nurses at the bedside. We've got to fix these right. environments. Yeah. They should just put nurses in charge of everything, Marianne. Then we could fix it. <laughs> um, yes. You know, and Beth, if I could say one more yeah, thing. Sure, of you course. Know, us call for a multifaceted approach. And one thing state legislators could do is pass the nurse licensure compact and the APRN compact. We have 41 states now in the nurse licensure compact, but there are still states such as Illinois that are not in it. And this is a huge cost to nurses. They don't realize that it not only helps hospitals bring in nurses so and they can shift nurses around and within their healthcare system when they're across the border, but Nurses are paying a lot more money and for licensure and continuing education to maintain their license in non-compact states. And this is something that legislators can do to relieve nurses of a huge burden. Yeah. No, thank you, Mary. And you must, I don't know, you've been at this a long time. So you must be like, oh, oh. beating this drum. You're still beating that drum, right? <laughs> Well, and you know, it's it's been about five or so years since we really revised the compact and states rejoined it. And, you know, we had we have the what we call really initially called the enhanced nurse licensure compact. But there are a handful left and they need to join. Yeah. And we have a compact for advanced practice nurses as well. Yeah. Well, and I found it interesting when, when telehealth became a thing during COVID that the medicine was looking to nursing and saying, look, nursing has this compact. Why don't we do what, you know, now medicine is thinking they need it. So maybe that'll help. I, I, I don't know. But certainly the whole telehealth has really pushed, I would hope has really pushed that agenda forward too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Marianne, this has been great. I am so glad to learn more about your work, learn more about the research. I just want to thank everyone for joining us today and let us know, please, anyone who's been listening, if you would like some resources, information, we will make sure that you have a link to the data from the study. So please let us know. And to find that information, please visit us on hire.vivian.com. And, and thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye.